Welcome everyone and thank you to those joining us live and to those listening in afterwards. I would like also warmly welcome our guests today whom I will shortly introduce. I am now pleased to introduce our panelists. Uh, welcome to Alistair Bursi, community pharmacist from New Brunswick College of Pharmacists Canada. David Skinner, president from International uh, Self-Care Foundation. Uh, Paris Aslani, professor of medicines use optimization from University of Sydney, Australia. And Petit Char. You are warmly welcome. I am your moderator today. My name is Sari Westermark. I am executive member of the community pharmacy section, FIP, proprietary pharmacist at Pihti First Pharmacy and a vice president in association of Finnish pharmacies. PIP's vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective quality and affordable medicines and health technologies. Our mission is to support global health by enabling the achievement of pharmaceutical practice, sciences and education. We are pleased to be delivering this event, episode number three of our program on 17 events of self-care, shaping the future of self-care through pharmacy. As healthcare providers, pharmacists have an important role to play in supporting self-care. This program is composed of eight episodes that refocus on accelerating universal health coverage for all by enabling self-care through community pharmacy. And additionally, nine episodes will focus on self-care support for community pharmacy teams. Please note, this event will be recorded live streamed on FIP YouTube profile and will be available at www.fip.org. To all those listening, please feel free to send your questions through the who at a box and we will be picking those up throughout today's session. Next slide, please. FIP would like to thank Regit for supporting online program today. Thank you so much. Learning objectives of, of today's event are the first, summarize current practice of self-care delivery. Second, propose future practice of self-care delivery. Third, define people-centered care. Fourth, List the communication skills required for people-centered care. And the fifth, discuss how to build trust and report to deliver self-care. And our program today is, first presentation will be current practice in self-care delivery, country case study by Alistair Bursi, uh, future practice in self-care delivery by David Skinner, People-Centered Care, Required Communication Skills by Parisa Aslani, and Building Trust and Report to Deliver Self-Care by Betty Char. Then we will have panel discussion, and you are well, very welcome to send questions. And then we will have summary and close. And now I have a great possibility to say welcome. To, for, for our first presenter, Mr. Alistair Bursi. And the presentation will be current practice in self-care delivery country case study. study. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Um, as, I, as you said, as I, you might have learned, my name is Alistair Bursi. I'm a pharmacist practicing in uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And today I'll give you some current practice self-care in our region of uh, the country. So if we go to the next slide. So I, I don't have any disclosures whatsoever. So I thought I would start off with this slide right here, which is um, a good overall uh, 
two things. One, a geography location of where New Brunswick uh, is in Canada, as you can see there. Probably most people are quite familiar with the area of Boston. Uh, we're about six hour drive northeast of there. And this is actually our New Brunswick COVID dashboard uh, that the government is putting online every day. This is a little old. It's actually, we're right now at 75% of patients getting first dose in New Brunswick. It's a province of about 780,000 people, and we've got a, over 500,000 people immunized. So it's, uh, it's certainly been, uh, like everyone in the world, a very uh, you know, trying time, a very challenging time. I can say that in New Brunswick, we've done extremely well and very fortunate. So next slide. So, you know, fairly, uh, you know, everybody in this uh, presentation are probably familiar with self-care, the definitions that we have through, whether it's from WHO or FIP. You know, I th certainly think that it's in many ways over the years, it's loosened up access for patients to get medic medicines that may have been, you know, restricted as prescription only. Uh, fortunately, pharmacists have been able to either treat that over the counter or under supervision by the pharmacist. So next slide. So I thought I'd give you a rough overview of what the um, current scope of practice is in Canada. So um, Canada is very unique because we have 10 provinces and basically almost like 10 different uh, countries from a perspective of health practice. Everything's provincially regulated um, from, it's federally regulated too, but you know, healthcare is delivered by the provinces in Canada. So we've seen two different um, themes kind of emerge across the country. Um, one is the liberalization of access to downscheduling of medications. So these would be medications that originally were prescription only, but are now available over the counter or through consultation with your pharmacist. And then in parallel, we've also seen a liberalization of pharmacist prescriptive authority. So this means that pharmacists can assess patients for conditions and also be able to prescribe for the treatment of those conditions. So we've seen a variety of those type of, um, of those practices, some of them uh, may actually be, you know, full prescriptive authority, like for example, Alberta, whereas other jurisdictions have gone to picking certain disease states. So next slide. And as you can see here, this is, I did highlight New Brunswick. Uh, I did make a little modification to the chart uh, that our Canadian Pharmacists Association has, uh, just to bring it up to date a little bit. We do have in New Brunswick, you can see there, independent uh, prescriptive authority and legislation, but we don't have the regulations in place yet. And we also have the ability to adapt and manage uh, medicine. So if a physician prescribes a certain drug, it's not available, or there's an allergy, we can do a therapeutic substitution or modification. So we do have a pretty good scope in New Brunswick. Next slide. So as I spoke to a little bit earlier, there has been downscheduling in Canada. I would say over the years, Canada has been in some ways a bit uh, less permissive in accessing over the medicines that were prescription now over the counter. But, uh, you know, obviously if we live near the United States, uh, which I think has been very progressive in this area in many ways, we are starting to see that influence north of the border. So in Canada, basically there's three schedules to most medicines. I'm not gonna get narcotics and controls, uh, but there's schedule three. So that would be medications generally seen in self-selection areas. Schedule two would be medicines that are kept behind the counter and are under the purview of the pharmacist. So these would be, for example, low dose coding combination products or pseudoephedrine. And then schedule one, which would be medications that require a prescription from an authorized prescriber. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'll give you some examples of medicines we've seen over the years. I'd say the last six or seven years, we've seen a lot of these medicines come on the market. So these are downscheduled medications that are either available smaller quantities, or, you know, they've been able to be downscheduled so that pharmacists can either, uh, have, you know, give them to patients at the cash through a consultation or they're available out in the aisle. So, you know, whether it's naproxen, esomeprazole, fluticasone, nasal sprays, you know, there's quite a few that are starting to come on the market. This is great because it gives patients who have self-identified their condition, they can either come in and consult with the pharmacist, or if they do it again, they can certainly know exactly what treatment they need. So, and obviously with Canada, we've been very fortunate with being the most trusted health professional and are quite readily available for patients. Let's go to the next slide. On the flip side, the other path that we've seen is uh, expansion of pharmacist prescriptive authority. So what that means is basically 
pharmacists have had numerous uh, expansions of scope, whether it's extending existing prescriptions. Um, during COVID-19 for the last year and a half, uh, we've been able to extend uh, narcotics and control prescriptions. So that would be, for example, methadone or hydromorphone. Uh, we've been able to also prescribe and administer vaccines for a fairly long time in Canada. Uh, we've also been able to prescribe treatments for some, you know, some jurisdictions like Alberta for any disease states where they have full prescriptive authority. And also we've had other provinces that haven't been able to quite make that jump, whether for whatever reason, they have started to try to pick specific disease states that are common for patients that they've self-identified or self-diagnosed and that they're able to come into the pharmacy and be assessed by the pharmacist and retrieve, uh, receive care fairly quickly. So we've seen that in Saskatchewan, we've seen it in New Brunswick and in other provinces throughout the uh, country. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, just gonna kind of go through those four or five different uh, scenarios. So in New Brunswick, we've actually been very fortunate. Uh, we've had great leadership from our government and our, uh, you know, our public health department. Uh, we were fortunate to lock things down right before everybody came back from, I guess you would call March break in North America. And uh, we were featured you know, quite prevalently throughout North America for having such low case numbers throughout this. Uh, during this point, the pharmacists have really uh, shined because you know, obviously we've never shut down our practices. Uh, there was a period there where most physician, family physicians and community shut down the practice for March and April. And it was to that point that pharmacists were extending prescriptions for patients that could no longer get access to their uh, family physician, to the point that pharmacists were often top five prescribers in, in pharmacies, which is, uh, you know, gives you an idea how much they were doing it. Uh, in addition to that, federal government gave us a temporary exemption for pharmacists to prescribe narcotic controls and allow nar straight narcotic transfers. And patients who needed extensions and medication treatments could request extension across all medications. So there were no restrictions and that worked out really well. Um, so if a patient obviously has been on a medicine for a long time, they know they need the extension, we were able to extend it. Go to the next slide. So self-care can also occur with vaccinations. So there are kind of a couple of ways that this can happen. Uh, there are medicines that are publicly available, for example, influenza vaccines, uh, the COVID-19 vaccines, um, patients can appear in the pharmacy or make an appointment, they give us their consent and we then administer the medicine. So it's quite readily available. Um, there's other ways too, for example, there's a list there from our New Brunswick College of Pharmacists, which shows what are all the vaccines that pharmacists can uh, assess and prescribe for. So we have, you know, for example, uh, patients coming in that are looking for Twinrex, which is hepatitis A and B. Um, or Shingrex for you know, shingles, the prevention, we can assess the patient then prescribe for those vaccines. And usually it runs probably about a 20 minute process and might be an extra 15 minutes if the patient wants to get the medicine administered at the pharmacy. Go to the next slide. So we've had quite a successful year in New Brunswick. Uh, we have a universal flu program. So as I said, 780,000 people in New Brunswick, there was about 300,000 flu shots that were given uh, this uh, October to uh, January. And the pharmacists actually administered 50% of the influenza vaccines in less than eight weeks, which is quite phenomenal. The uh, other health professionals took about four months to get to that point. And one, as one of my peers in Moncton, um, he actually had a drive-through flu shot clinic where he did a thousand patients in one day. So I think that, like he said, was a, definitely a rehearsal for the COVID vaccine. And you can see here our premier, um, the Honorable Blaine Higgs, and also our health minister both went to uh, pharmacies to get their flu shots. So that's been great. Go to the next slide. And we've also had a lot of success with COVID-19 vaccines. We've been fortunate that we've had a decent supply, uh, perhaps not as abundant as the United States, but since they've been wrapping up things, We've certainly gotten a lot of flu back, uh, sorry, COVID-19 vaccines coming in. And what's very interesting is that the public health and the Department of Health have been very engaged with pharmacies to make sure that patients had access to COVID-19 throughout all the communities. There's 200, probably about 230, 240 pharmacies throughout uh, New Brunswick and about 218 are actually administering it. So we uh, received a request to come and help out back in January 17th of this year and March 17th was the first day that uh, COVID-19 vaccine was given on the community setting and patients can either book or online or via phone. 
So if you go to the next setting, the slide. So basically this is, this data is probably about a week old, but this is where we're at right now. So um, regional health authorities, these, they put on health clinics that started in December, uh, mostly focusing on vaccinating, uh, you know, essential staff in hospitals and then throughout community practice. And pharmacy started about three and a half months later. And from perspective, first dose is administered. Uh, pharmacies, you know, certainly gained ground very quickly. We've given roughly 47% of all the first doses in the community setting. We've started as of a week and a half ago, giving patients second doses. And we're, I believe we're doing about 31,000 vaccines per week. Now that might be a little bit of old data, uh, but that's about 4,500 vaccines in, a phar in pharmacies throughout the province. Per, per day, which is quite impressive. And I think that's actually been ramping up closer to about 35 to 40,000. So as I said earlier, patients can present to the pharmacy, they can get their shot. If they've gone to the clinics for the first time, as long as they have that sheet that says they've got proof immunization, they can certainly go to a pharmacy for the second dose. If we go to the next slide. Some other things that we do in New Brunswick, um, you know, you might know them as common ailments, we call them minor ailments in Canada, um, is enable patients to get prompt treatment for self-identified conditions. And there's a list over there, and most patients are quite adept at figuring out what type of condition they have. And one thing that was very unique for New Brunswick when we started this a while back was that we actually had the authority to do assessments for ba uh, basic urinary tract infections. So, um, which, Certainly was unique in the sense that it was, um, you know, obviously we're prescribing uh, antibiotics. There's certainly a lot to think about from a stewardship, antimicrobial stewardship uh, perspective there with bacterial resistance. So it was quite unique. Uh, we were fortunate to get it through and it worked out really well. Now, uh, New Brunswick was the first study, to, uh, that was the place where the first study uh, was done to look at the benefit of patient reduction in treatment in comparison to usual care. So if we go to the next slide. So this was some of the marketing material that our New Brunswick Pharmacy Association had put together to engage the public. So urinary tract infections are interesting because they're ideally suited for patients in the self-care uh, sector, you know, concept because, you know, most patients are very familiar with the conditions and symptoms. It's the one of the top five reasons for ER visits and top 10 reasons for ambulatory care access in Canada. We do have significant um, acute access issues in New Brunswick, and I think that's quite prevalent throughout the country. Um, so the idea is that we can take some of that load off of hospitals, emergency rooms. Uh, we can you know, certainly improve access for patients. So obviously when you're prescribing for these types of situations after you do the assessment, uh, we wanna make sure that you know, we're thinking about which antibiotics are most effective, an appropriate algorithm so that we don't use, as we would say, the big guns, uh, the big the gun uh, anti antibiotics first, we wanna use the ones that are first line. So, and if you go to the next slide, there was some pretty amazing research done by, uh, by our gentleman here, Nathan Beam, where he looked at the outcomes of pharmacists prescribing, assessing and prescribing for UTIs in, uh, in, uh, in New Brunswick. So. Not only that, what they found was about 89% of the patient's symptoms were resolved uh, very quickly. Patients actually received care one full day sooner, which is quite impressive. And pharmacists followed appropriate prescribing protocols far greater than physicians. Um, and the mean cost, they actually did a separate study on the cost. And this is the total cost, not just the cost of care, but the total cost that's incurred by the patient. And the pharmacists were, you know, as you can see there, $72 versus family physician, 141 and 368 for ERs. And keep in mind that when you look at this from the perspective of patients receiving care one full day sooner, um, you know, there's quite a dichotomy from being able to walk into a pharmacy, being assessed, being prescribed medicine, and the process may be taking 15 to 20 minutes. Whereas if you know, oftentimes patients would have to go either to a walk-in clinic, which, which can be hours of wait at minimum, or they would go to an emergency room where you can vary from anywhere from three hours to 10 hours for care. So there was a huge, you know, there was a huge reception to this from patients that really loved this, uh, this, this type of therapy. If we go to the next slide. So next step, so currently the UTI, UTI assessments aren't funded by the government um, in New Brunswick, although we're hopeful that we're gonna hear some news in September. 
uh, for UTI funding and a couple other things. We've seen other provinces based on what we've been able to do here and demonstrate, we've seen other provinces be able to adopt the same thing. So Nova Scotia, for example, or, or for our neighbors next door, they've been able to um, get funding for UTIs, for um, oral contraceptive prescribing and also shingles. So it's quite impressive how, you know, every province seems to kind of move the, the bar, raise the bar across the country, uh, which is certainly very interesting. So if we go to the next slide. You know, I think the final words uh, from looking at, you know, case studies in, in one province in Canada is that, you know, I think there's a lot of themes, common themes here worldwide, you know, self-care flourishes when patients have access to the treatments they need. I think pharmacists and health officials can expedite access to treatments by eliminating a lot of these barriers to care. I think pharmacists are very responsible in the process and the assessment and the appropriate prescribing. And I think that there's, there's huge advantages for this. And whether it's, a, you know, you're offering self-care through readily available medicines in the aisle or over the counter uh, with expert advice or convenient assessments and prescribing for common ailments, pharmacists have a key role to play in self-care. Uh, obviously, we want to thank our sponsors for the, uh, the great lineup today. And if you have any questions, hopefully we'll have some at the uh, session at the end. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alistair, for your very interesting presentation. So now I want to say welcome to Mr. David Skinner, who is president in International Self-Care Foundation. And we will have a presentation, Future Practice in Self-Care Delivery. Stage is yours. Thank you. Next slide, please. Well, when we're looking at shaping the future. Um, I think it's always uh, helpful to look a little bit at the past, but we don't need to look at a very deep past. Our, our recent past gives us lots of lessons and opportunities that emerged from some of the measures that were taken during our COVID uh, experience. Um, initially, as you know, the public health measures that were uh, initiated were intended to flatten the curve and allow for um, serious cases to be managed in hospital and ICUs. And the whole issue of uh, social distancing, et cetera, was very much the foundation of self-care. Uh, we know from data that you know, just minor increases in self-care can free up plenty of healthcare resources in the formal healthcare system to deal with more ex uh, seriously uh, existing diseases. And um, if I could have the next slide, please. It really drives home the point is, um, what are the measures that were used for flattening the curve? Well, uh, these things like hand washing and sanitizing, wearing a mask, social distancing, the thing that bothered me about how this was positioned by our healthcare, public health care officials is they kept talking about these being good public health measures, and indeed they are. As you'll see from the next slide, it is not just that they're public health measures, these are good self-care measures. If you look at the seven pillars of self-care that ISF has developed over the years and, and maintains is um, these things are uh, very much related to risk reduction. Uh, these uh, Just wearing masks, social distancing, keeping your hands clean, just good self-care measures. Next slide, please. So my question is, why did the politicians and public health officials avoid saying that these public health benefits arise from simple self-care actions taken by individuals every day? I may speculate a little bit on that later, but it was puzzling to me why it was never positioned as a self-care activity. Next slide, please. So we, we entered the 2020s, the roaring 20s uh, some still talk about, but we entered the 2020s with a bang, so to speak, from COVID. And it raised the question, you know, is there a real opportunity for self-care from the lessons we learned in COVID? And really, when you think about it, COVID self-care measures are just the tip of the iceberg. But those simple three things for flattening the curve and relieving pressure on the healthcare system take uh, immense meaning 
when you run it over non-communicable diseases of all types. And the simple ones are easy to imagine, you know, uh, quit smoking measures, um, reduce uh, obesity, lots and lots of lifestyle diseases. Uh, self, while COVID isn't really a lifestyle disease, the things that we learn about how people can look after themselves gives hope for the 2020s being a great opportunity for self-care. The ISF focuses always on evidence-based approaches to enabling self-care. So we're always looking for data. In fact, Alistair's uh, study that he highlighted at the end of his presentation is a great example of how quantifying the effects of self-care can be a great tool for raising awareness within the policy framework for governments and for individual practice for pharmacy, medicine, and everybody that's involved in healthcare, as well as at the individual level. We see that there is a changing attitude towards self-care, and I'm going to present a, a few studies that, that really give some uh, quantification to that. Um, and those studies were all done during the pandemic just to find out how people might be changing their attitudes towards self-care. Next slide, please. So we'll start with a Canadian study, as I am in Canada. Um, this was really studying uh, in, in resp response to COVID, um, how much self-care information are people seeking now versus prior to COVID? Then if you look at the far right side, you can see the, 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 the somewhat less is being very small, but the majority of people are looking either for more or much more self-care information. And this runs right across a whole uh, plethora of disease states. Next slide, please. But you know, when we're asking people, where do they look? Um, it's, it's very actually uh, refreshing and, um, and inspiring that when you look at the most common sources uh, being trustworthy, and that's really the critical issue about access to information for self-care, is there's a lot of really bad information out there. And there are efforts underway to try and counteract that, particularly when it came to COVID. But here's where the health professionals such as doctors, nurses, and pharmacists in particular, score very well as a trustworthy or very trustworthy source of information. And that bodes well for the, the opportunities to build self-care through the professional practice. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, so when, when we look at this uh, even more so, and, and we ask, you know, do you have greater information seeking behavior? And we, we see a, a, that almost a quarter of people said yes, since it's this outbreak, we really want to manage our own healthcare conditions. And we have done this without visiting a doctor. Uh, so we said, you know, <laughs> what did you do? Uh, the two, two big things that stood out for me, and the number one, of course, is look for information on how to care for the ailment myself, is supported by the other um, major uh, influence, which is got advice from a pharmacist. When we look at these two data points themselves, it reveals a great potential for pharmacy practice. Next slide, please. Uh, shifting a bit to the UK, we see similar numbers. Uh, Canada was 25%. Here in the UK, it's 32%. In terms of people that have changed their attitude, the way they access healthcare services. And that's really speaking to uh, the increase in self-care versus running to an emergency or a uh, practitioner's office for uh, minor ailments and other kinds of mild to moderate treatments. Next slide, please. These two numbers I've circled here from the same study really goes back to uh, that core principle of uh, how eager people are to look after themselves and 31% of the people who would not have even consulted a pharmacist as their first option said they would more likely do so after the pandemic. A 31% growth in anything is phenomenal. And so there again, we really see a reflection of people's willingness to access more information about self-care and increase their use of pharmacy services. 69% uh, of the people who might've considered self-care as their first option before 
said that they also wouldn't be more likely to do so in the future. Again, two good indicators for the opportunity for pharmacy. Next slide, please. An EU report was recently re released as well, um, and it looked at some of the COVID impacts such as internet searches for health information. They found that that was on um, the increase and that over half of the people between ages 16 to 74 were seeking online help for self-care. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there is a concomitant rise in misinformation. And uh, the WHO Director General was very uh, blunt when he said, we're not just fighting a pandemic, we're fighting an infodemic. And you know, this is really an area where pharmacy can shine. If you go back to the previous slides where we talked about uh, the trust in pharmacy, the opportunity and access to pharmacy, we can go back forward again, it's okay, don't worry about that. Um, and I, I've got to say that one of the key pillars that is a right for the taking for pharmacy is to improve health literacy in your patients. Because health literacy at the end of the day has to be based on good quality advice. People looking for quality advice, you have it. Great opportunity for growth. Next slide, please. So in Australia, the Mitchell Institute issued a national priority um, uh, policy proposal for, for Australia. It was very well received very well uh, researched. And they had several policy um, initiatives that they, they flagged to the Australian government, uh, some of which is being actively undertaken in their recent budget. Uh, some improvement in health literacy was uh, funded, but I've put a few stars just beside the ones that jump right off the page as opportunities for pharmacy. I would say that pharmacy does have opportunities in all these policy areas, but Improving health literacy, amazing. Building self-care into your healthcare practice, another great opportunity. Enabling the consumers to be active partners. And I think that's a critical issue. I'll we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And assuring the quality and accessibility of digital health information, great opportunity there. And of course, we can't ignore funding models that are necessary to support self-care services in, in the profession. Next slide, please. There are four enablers. Uh, I guess there may be more, but these are the four that are sort of commonly and, and generally accepted that in, in order to get better self-care, you need consumer and patient empowerment, good self-care health policy, a positive regulatory environment, and stakeholder support and adoption of self-care principles, indeed as embodied in the seven pillars of self-care. Next slide. What about the first one? Well, empowerment, there, there, there are many, many uh, kinds of things that can be done for empowerment. Here are just a few. Uh, access to medical records, we're getting better and better at having electronic opportunity to access our medical records. Um, improved health information technology for self-care. More and more can we find things online. Development of apps is important, uh, but always uh, with the view in mind to having this as good quality information. Um, we also need to do some measuring and promotion of health, liter health literacy. It's fine to say health literacy is important, and a lot of people you know, do say that, but taking action and then measuring the outcomes, that would be critical. And ISF is always interested in uh, looking at people that are doing research that are actually measuring outcomes from different stimuli, and health literacy is, is one of the top ones that, uh, that is important for patient empowerment. Um, again, I've said it, something about uh, integrating uh, all pro approaches, but respecting patient choice is always a part, and I know that every pharmacist has um, a real good appreciation about how different patients have different um, backgrounds, different uh, preferences, and being able to respect those choices and be able to accommodate those in your care uh, to that patient will actually promote that bond between you and the patient and give them some empowerment at the same time. Next slide. I'll try and hurry it up a little bit. Uh, Self-care health policy, everybody talks about it again, uh, very little specificity and therefore uh, what we need to do, much like the Australian group, is to really put uh, some specific policy imperatives on the table for government. Um, 
formalizing self-care in government architecture. The United Kingdom is the only one in the past who has really done uh, much about that. But even so, there's always a call for a, a comprehensive self-care strategy in all healthcare policy initiatives at, at all uh, country levels. Um, and this needs to actually be better articulated as well. Uh, asking for something general pol politically never really flies. Seeking something in specific that you can actually provide some evidence for that does fly and Alistair showed how that pays dividends in seeking um, a scope of practice improvement. Um, health promotion funding for self-care education needs to be provided and financial incentives, for example, uh, in the United States health savings accounts. Um, in Canada, there are government programs for paying as there are in other countries, but uh, the full scope of financial incentives needs to be explored. Tear down the silos. One of the reasons why things don't always work as well as they can um, is that uh, governments and even professions uh, tend to act in silos. For example, if you would speak to the Minister of Health, they think self-care is good. And they say, well, what, what kind of financial incentives can we do to support it? They say, don't talk to me, talk to the finance minister. We gotta tear down the silos and have people talk to each other. Next slide, please. Regulatory environment, uh, we need robust requirements for quality information, not just product advertising. Uh, a lot of people think about, you know, information is what people see uh, on websites from companies or advertising. No, it's, it's not just about that, although you do need good uh, controls on uh, misleading advertising, but uh, some standards for how quality information is, uh, is valued and judged. Um, Again, using the self-care lens when examining RX OTC, Alistair talked about some downscheduling items, um, but often historically it's been looked at as from the RX end of the telescope and not looking at, you know, how would this enable self-care? Best practice models for improvements are the endpoints. Again, Alistair pointed out uh, that the study on uh, improved outcomes and always that's uh, where I think we want to start. We want to start with a good outcome in mind, but always measure it. Uh, the regulations need to be uh, able to accommodate that in terms of uh, kinds of clinical practice research, as well as um, drug model research. Pharmacy practice regulation and proving a broader range of therapy. I won't go into a lot of detail about that. Uh, Alistair covered some of that in, in the next slide. And, and stakeholder support more than just words. Um, yes, that's I, I see a lot of people speaking about self-care. Uh, I'd like to see a bit more action-oriented agendas. Um, and, and that agenda would look at what, how do we improve the opportunities, not in terms of necessarily just one aspect. It's, it's both breadth and depth of opportunity for self-care. Uh, we need to emphasize health when we talk about self-care, not just you know, bubble baths, um, while some of the uh, cosmetic slash, uh, you know, self-indulgence, so to speak, um, opportunities in self-care have dominated the landscape. Uh, there's been less and less talk in the mainstream about things that are really health oriented. And it's, yes, during COVID, you need to take some time for yourself and refresh, but that's not all there is to self-care. Um, posed the question, is there is this time, the 2020s, the opportunity for a global self-care summit? I'll leave that for you to noodle around, but I'm, this is something that I'm quite interested in. Next slide, please. So the decade of self-care, consumers are eager, technologies are there to enable, the resources are dispersed, and the opportunities exist for integration of self-care into healthcare practices. The expanding scope of pharmacy practice is an amazing opportunity. Um, it's recognized in, at FIP in its vision. It's, it's recognized worldwide, A, that pharmacy is underutilized and highly respected, but that pharmacy has a great opportunity to influence self-care for the future. Next slide. Uh, vaccinations were already spoken about as expanding scope of practice and self-care. Um, prescribing, 
Uh, so diagnostic tools, I think it was like 1980 when I suggested that possibly there was an opportunity for a self-care test for strep, which if uh, available, pharmacists could then have the tools to be able to A, diagnose and B, prescribe. Um, the minor ailment scheme has already been covered, but I'm going to say that uh, minor ailments uh, is, again, part of the tip of the iceberg. It's a bit more of the traditional way, uh, minor aches and pains. We need to look at how technology will enable um, all practices, pharmacy, nurses, everybody, um, to actually expand their scope and overlap with others in the healthcare community so that it is much more patient-centered and team-based. Team um, coaching. Um, pharmacists have a great opportunity for coaching and, and you know, we need to get, get on with health literacy and really uh, develop good communications tools. And again, um, being part of the outcome, outcome measurement that will support health policy to integrate self-care into uh, daily practice and overall professional uh, acumen. Next slide. I'll end with this quotation, and it's directly from FIP, because I couldn't say it better. Pharmacists have an opportunity to emerge from this crisis with clearer priorities and innovative means to better provide health care and responsible self-care for all. And given it's maybe the decade, the roaring 20s of self-care, let's all cheer for self-care for all by 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for your very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, our next presenter will be, I, I will say welcome to Professor Parissa Aslani, who is president in University of Sydney. And her presentation will be people-centered care required communication skills. The stage is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Sari. Going to now move my slides forward. Um, my presentation is going to be around um, people-centered cared and required communication skills. Good evening, good day, and good morning to everyone, wherever you are dialing in from or zooming in from. It's great to have you join the webinar. Welcome. Um, thank you for FIP and the organizers for inviting me to present today. And I'll spend the next 15 minutes really focusing around people-centered self-care or people-centered care. Um, as you've heard, the aim of the session today is around what is happening now and what can we do better in the future in terms of self-care. And I'm gonna focus on, I guess, the people aspect um, and that people empowerment aspect that you, um, you heard about in the previous presentation. As you noted, these were the learning objectives for today's session, and my focus will be on the defining people-centered care and looking at the communication skills that are essential for people-centered care. So the outline will be around, well, what is person-centered care? What is people-centered care? And I guess what is patient-centered care? All the terms that we've been hearing about. Why do we need? Um, focus on person-centered care and how can we achieve this person-centered care and what are the essential communication skills that are required. It's the importance I guess in achieving patient-centered care is around looking at not just the disease but the patient who has the disease and this quote really exemplifies patient-centered care. And what we're expecting the shift to be is really not just looking at that disease and focusing specifically on the disease, but looking at this, the whole holistic view of person-centered care. And this diagram, I think, which I've taken from the particular website listed there, I think exemplifies what person-centered care is. It is this holistic view of everything that there is. And in fact, the Institute for Medicine defined patient-centered care as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences. 
their needs and values and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. The Institute continued to say that really patient-centered care is the essential ingredient and foundation for quality healthcare and patient safety. Patient-centered care is not new, it's an evolving concept and it was first depicted by Edith Ballant in 1969. So it's been evolving for quite a long period of time. And everywhere you see the patient, the person, or the people-centered care approach being described and discussed. And there are many frameworks that actually outline um, what it is. But which one do we use? Well, if you look at patient-centered care, the focus is really still around symptoms and disease and the medicines and their therapy. It's again, not so much focused on the holistic. Well, when we use the term people or person-centered care, the term is much more holistic. It's looking at or acknowledging the health and well-being as well as the illness of the person. It's focusing and including their preferences, beliefs, and values. It's engaging with their families, carers, caregivers, their social support network, the people that are involved in their care. And we're also looking at not just treatment, but also preventative. So the focus changes. And so what I will continue probably talking for the rest of the presentation is more around person-centered care as opposed to what I've been talking about, which is patient-centered care. But noting that I might flip from one to the other because of the evidence that's out there. Now, I just wanna take a moment to remind us that really we've known for the last 20 years that having a person-centered care has, has good impacts on people's health outcomes. It's led to improvements in medication adherence. It increases physician satisfaction with the care that's being provided. It increases patient satisfaction with the care that they're receiving. And it's led to reduce symptom severity and decreased utilization of healthcare sources. This is only one sample of very old data to show that really that person-centered care has positive impacts. And since then and in the past 20 years, there's a hell of a lot more evidence to support that really person-centered care has much better health outcomes and outcomes for everyone involved. So how do we go about creating this person-centered care? Well, the essence of it is finding out and understanding what is important to the person. It's around fostering trust, and we'll hear about that in our next presentation. It's establishing mutual respect, and it's working to the, together with the person and their support team. And it's also sharing decisions on treatment plans. And I'll go into all of this in detail. What I wanna emphasize is that in order to be able to self-care and self-manage, a person requires the knowledge, the skills, the self-efficacy amongst other resources to be able to self-care and self-manage. And one as and underpinning the ability to empower patients in order to give them the knowledge, to give them the skills and equip them with their appropriate self-efficacy is being able to focus on that person and having that pet person-centered care. But as individual healthcare practitioners, that alone is not going to be adequate. Person-centered care is also holistic when it comes to the provider, the organization, and the system. The patient really only sits down here and we require everyone involved at all levels in order to be able to address person-centered care. So if you look at it, we need the structure in place at the healthcare system and organization level. We need the appropriate resources that are person-centered. We need to have the organizational culture that's person-centered. In terms of the process and the interaction that happens between the healthcare provider and the patient, effective communication is essential. And I'll go into more detail in a minute. We need to be able to engage the patient. We need to have a dialogue. And finally, outcomes are essential. And we need to be able to monitor and measure the right outcomes to show whether there is value in that person-centered care. So in terms of um, healthcare system and organization, it's around creating a person-centered culture and it's supporting a person-centered environment. So we have to think about the structure, the systems, the organization, the environment. We have to be able to co-design and therefore involve patients in the design of health promotion and educational programs that empower them, that support their knowledge and support their self-care. 
and also in order to address their health literacy. We need to be able to then measure that the person-centered care is being effective. And as I mentioned earlier around communication, the communication has several aspects. It's not just about communicating, but it's also about the non-verbals that show the respect and compassionate care. And again, the engagement and access to appropriate care. So let's focus on more around the communication aspects to how do we establish person-centered care? Well, there are several steps to it. And I guess the most important step to begin with is your active listening. It's not just about hearing, but it's actually listening and understanding. So it's asking the appropriate questions to gain the information that's needed to have a good understanding of the preferences, values, and needs of the individual. It's getting the necessary information that's needed in order to know, well, how can we um, give the patient the necessary knowledge, the skills, the empowerment in order to be able to self-manage and self-care and knowing that that information that's being provided is at the right level for the person and our communication also has to come through our non-verbal noting that really only 20 percent of communication is what we say and about 80 percent is how we say it through our non-verbal behavior and as part of active listening it's always important to reflect back what we've heard what we've understood and the information that we've gained to make sure that we are actually focused on the right needs of the patient and i guess of what they're telling us as a next step it's around sharing information and it's information that's provided at the right level for them um, so it's information that can be found and understood and it can be information that can be acted upon so really at that functional health literacy level that's appropriate for the person. Um, and health literacy is not so much focusing on knowledge gain, but it's really the ability to understand the information, find the information and act on that information in an appropriate way. The information that we want to share is information that's going to be useful for the patient around diagnosis and condition, around medication related information and self-management. Noting that really at the end of the day, we want quality and safe use of medicines. We want to know that people can look after their own health, can self-manage, can know when things are working, and also know when things are not working and who to re refer to. And finally, in engaging that support network. It's essential to know who is involved in the patient care and be able to take them in and also share that information with them. This helps in building capacity, not for the individual, but also around within the network that supports them. And as part of this engagement, as part of communication, we're also providing resources, not just to the patient or the person, but to their support network and helping to identify the barriers that there is to self-management and ensuring continuity of care across transitions of care. So as I mentioned earlier around non-verbal behavior, the respect and compassionate care is part, is essential to patient or person-centered care. We need to be responsive through how to demonstrating non-verbally that we're being responsive to their preferences, needs and values. We also have to demonstrate that partnership through our non-verbal and establish that partnership. And of course, building trust is essential. And it doesn't just come from how we communicate verbally, but it's also how we communicate non-verbally. And so back again to the per person and care engagement, I just want to draw in, I guess, around that involvement and how do we involve people? And we've heard a lot about co-design in various forms and it's kind of a, not maybe new, but maybe about five or so years old. And this involves engaging people as part of a person-centered care so that they are active partners in designing their own care plans and their own goal setting and in the shared decision-making. And all of this supports self-efficacy. So involving people in part of their care through effective communication is essential um, for self-care. Finally, I'd like to sum up um, really around um, person-centered care for effective self-care. It's around the individual and the organization and the system, looking at the person as a whole, 
understanding the individual's needs, thinking about, well, what is it that they need? Then it's thinking about the disease and illness and the individual's experience of that illness and putting that in the context of the whole. And at the same time, thinking about, well, what is the common ground? What is it around the management of the illness, the management of the condition within the person's um, context? And how can we actually reach that common ground through effective communication? So goal setting for the person, but also within the common ground of healthcare and quality and safe medicine use. And then looking at that relationship and that interaction, again, through effective communication in order to be able to increase knowledge, increase skills, increase self-efficacy, and ensure that the person is able to effectively self-care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Parisa, for your very interesting and informative presentation. And now there is time for the next presentation. I want very warmly welcome Dr. Betty Char, who's associate uh, professor, uh, research academic director in Faculty of Medicine and Health. And her presentation will be building trust and report to deliver self-care in community pharmacy. The stage is yours. Thank you, Sari, and uh, thank you all for attending. Greetings from uh, Sydney. Um, it is evening here and it is winter, so um, it's great to see you all on the screen and I welcome you all warmly. I'd also like to thank my previous uh, speakers, my colleagues, and I will draw on their wisdom to guide us through my, uh, my talk today, which is based on uh, the, the importance of trust in pharmacy. I think I'll start by defining what trust is. Technically, trust is the firm belief in the reliability, truth, or ability of someone or something. Now, as Parisa um, highlighted, Trust is a very important, and I dare say, I think I would claim it to be the most important item or, or skill that we have as pharmacists in growing uh, people's uh, acceptance of our services. So next slide, please. Who do we trust? Is it, uh, you know, the, the local plumber or the motor mechanic? Is it, um, is it the, 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 the family relationships that we have or the people that we dearly love? In, in the context of pharmacy, we are looking for trust in, in our professional roles. And pharmacist, next slide, please. Pharmacists and their patient, trust for pharmacists and their patients plays a key factor in the pharmacy landscape. When I talk to my students about the difference between a profession and an occupation, trust is one of the key elements that features in the description and the distinction between a professional and an occupation or, a, or a, um, a simple uh, plumber or a simple mechanic. What distinguishes us as pharmacists from, from the, the claim or the, 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 the vision that, or the view that they think we are business people is the fact that patients trust us. Next slide, please. So this is documented in many polls. Patients trust pharmacists and rely on their accessibility. This was last year. Pharmacists retain their spot in third place amongst trusted professions, and it's a long list, trust me. 
pharmacists continue to be one of the most trusted professionals in the USA. So this was in 2019, and it continues. And we have been proudly on the top of our, the list of, of patients' preferences and trust elements um, for, for many, many years. This we can be proud of. But as I see it and as my colleagues have highlighted, the pandemic that we have lived through has actually had a silver lining for pharmacists. And this silver lining is the opportunity for us as pharmacists to shine even more, to shine and to show what we can offer the human, uh, the human race in its entirety. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic has given us an opportunity. And in order to take up this opportunity and to expand the scope of our practice to include the vaccinations and the prescribing and the diagnostics and the and the issues that were highlighted by my colleagues, we need to have trust. Next slide, please. So in the context of community pharmacy in particular, while the, while the pharmacy landscape is rapidly evolving, the traditional ways of dispensing and storing patient data is going away, sort of, in a way. We are being more technically dependent, so to speak. But what is not going away and can't be ever replaced by technology is the trust between pharmacists and patients. And this is a human aspect of the interaction between the pharmacist and the patient. Next slide, please. Why is it important? Why is trust so important? So let's say, Patients trust their doctors to diagnose them correctly. Why should it be different to pharmacists, for example? It's up to the pharmacist to, to accurately fill the prescription and to educate the, the patient on what they'll be taking, communicate, etc. But it's not only that. Next slide, please. Trust is actually correlated with many positive benefits including the perception of better care, greater acceptance of recommended treatment, adherence to that treatment, and less anxiety in relation to the treatment that's being recommended. So trust is crucial for compliance, so to speak, and for uh, good outcomes for the patient. Next slide, please. Way back in 2016, my colleague Maria Allenson and I wrote an article about how to build and maintain trust with patients. And we found from the literature that patients are more likely to open up and disclose information if they trusted their pharmacist. And a better quality of interaction may result in greater patient autonomy and shared decision making. And this aligns with everything my colleague uh, Parisa has mentioned already. Next slide, please. So the, the um, article talked about how can pharmacists build trust with their patients. So as you probably have heard and probably all know, trust is not just um, you know, a skill to learn. It's actually earned. It's, it, you have to make an effort to gain someone's trust. It's not easy. But once we have achieved that trust, it can be mutually beneficial for both the pharmacist and the patient that we're dealing with. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, thank you. So the elements of trust that we identified a few years back but are applicable uh, today and always, there are four main elements of trust. They start all with C. So care and respect, compassion, communication. Communication has to be ethical and honest and competence in knowledge. Next slide, please. I'll, I'll explain each of these elements uh, separately. 
When we talk about care and respect, we're saying that as in any professional setting, having mutual respect leads to a lasting relationship. Pharmacists and healthcare professionals have an obligation not to allow any personal prejudices they may hold to detract from providing the highest quality patient care. So making a patient feel respected, despite their color, their religious beliefs, their difference, whatever the case may be, we have an obligation not to show that and not to allow anything to come between us in terms of perceptions of bias. And at the same time, professional boundaries must also be maintained at all times. If these are crossed, patients may lose trust and confidence in pharmacists. Next slide, please. We must have compassion. As Parisa has already mentioned, we treat patients with empathy. We try to understand their needs. We try to follow up. We try to ask them how they're going. We treat them as being worthy of our respect. And also, you know, think of us as being on the other side of, of this equation and being the recipient of health care. Um, how would you feel if you felt not respected? So the, 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 key, uh, the key magic issue is probably to make, make it as if it, we were the patient. And also to highlight the importance of confidentiality. So it's been said that if they are certain that the conversation regarding their health information is confidential, the patient is more likely to disclose the problem, their problem, honestly and not cover up, and therefore receiving a much more likely accurate solution to their problem. They, they are helped to be helped, so to speak, by being uh, careful about the way we deal with their questions, where we take their questions, how um, physically, how they, how they are um, pr protected from the rest of the people who might be listening. Take them away. Make sure that they have that environment and have the patience and um, listen to them, spend time and effort. It is a great investment. This is um, good for everything, for healthcare outcomes, for business outcomes, for, for the, the whole perspective of community pharmacy and the raison d'etre. Um, it is a great investment to have that special care and that patience um, to listen and to, to, to give time. I think the most precious element in our lives is time. We are also time poor, but you make that time, you make that effort, it is worth it. Next slide, please. So communication, I can't emphasize enough the importance of communication, which has already been explained um, to a certain extent, but in 10 minutes, it's hard to explain everything. But we do know that with competent communication and social skills, pharmacists will, be, will have an easier time listening to patients' concerns and providing a solution to them. It's important that pa patients feel that they are being listened to, active listening, and given information in a respectful, non-judgmental way. This will help build a trusted relationship. As Parisa has said, try to demonstrate active listening. When you're listening, paraphrase, summarize, clarify, reflect, come back to what they said, um, clarify, make sure that you've understood correctly, summarize. It's so important. So this active listening skill is something that you gain with experience, but also by being aware of how you are interacting with your uh, patient. And also the role of honesty. If somehow or on any uh, point or at any point, if the patient feels pharmacists are being dishonest or covering up in any way, they're likely to lose their respect and credibility. And then there's, there, there's no point. 
we we might be the best clinicians, but if we're being dishonest, it's not going to work. But in communication skills, I'd like to give an example of someone who um, was remarkable in her as a pharmacist in her approach to um, her clients, any person who entered her pharmacy, anyone from young to old would be named by their first name always from afar, wherever she was, at the back of the pharmacy, behind the dispensary. Hello, Betty. Hello, um, uh, Don. Hello, anybody. She would name them and it somehow resonated with people to a point where, you know, they felt they had this loyalty to her because she knew them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in the context of rapport. Uh, next slide, please. I think competence actually should come top of the list. I think the way that we gain um, trust in our services and in our um, capabilities and our expanded roles, if we are going to have them, is to have the competence to, to, to keep up our skills, to keep our skills up to date. Patients are by far more likely to feel confident and secure um, when your advice is up to date, cutting edge, and you know what you're talking about. It's not just about you. It's also about your staff. It's important to ad identify and address training needs for both yourself and your staff on a regular basis. None of us can, can maintain our knowledge um, from, from the time we graduated to, to the time we, we retire without updating, without continuous learning, without lifelong learning. And we have to do that for our staff as well. Always remember to work within your competence and refer on to the doctor or to a special, a, a special expert uh, for more if they need it. Or seek advice yourself or look up something yourself, but always recognise those limits whenever, whenever necessary. Encourage in your team a culture of openness and make sure that also mistakes happen. Um, we are we are humans, we err, but we have to report errors and make sure that we um, go back to the root cause analysis of the error and perhaps sh share all that with your staff. Make sure that when you get to the root cause of something that's gone wrong, share it, learn from it, move on. Ensure all your staff are aware of how to respond to and deal with patient complaints in an open and honest way. And very importantly also, join your local professional organisation. And I guess I'm talking to the converted already. All of you are members or guests of FIP, but also it's important to join your local profession, uh, professional organisation so that you're in the, um, the context of practice that is relevant to you um, and meaningful in terms of understanding what's going on around you. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'd like to emphasize is each of these four factors is necessary in a trusting, in building a trusting relationship, but insufficient in isolation. They can't work on their own. You can't be competent, but not able to communicate. You can't be a good communicator if you don't know your stuff. So all four factors together develop trust and they work magic sometimes um, when they all are aligned. They're like the stars that are aligning um, to make for better uh, patient-centered care. Next slide, please. Here are some practical ways to build trust in the pharmacy at a day-to-day -day level. Come out from behind that counter. Don't stay behind the dispensary. Make sure all your employees reinforce trust and do so in your marketing. Reinforce it in your marketing in the messages that you put out. Participate in your community. Call patients to check, check on them, follow up on them. Follow up on negative complaints or comments. If people have something to comment on, take note, follow up on it. 
meet the goals that you set for yourself. Don't set goals like, you know, we will finish your dispensing in five minutes no matter what. If you can't meet it, then that will affect people's trust in you. Get to know patients personally. As I said before, build rapport. Um, I, I will talk to that very briefly. I know I'm running out of time. Um, provide additional information if you can. If you can, do the research, send it to them, follow up with it. If they're keen on knowing and they're getting that information from you from a trusted um, source, it, it shows, it, it, it helps to grow and build that trust. And always, always listen to patients' needs. So to build rapport with your patients, communicate often and well. Effective communication is the foundation upon which you can establish trust with your patients. We've, we've talked about this, and um, I think I've emphasized that very clearly. Express your empathy. You need to be able to empathize with your patient without being emotionally overwhelmed yourself. Don't get too involved. But do show empathy, do show your listening. Project calmness. Take it easy. Don't get too excited um, or, uh, you know, too, too uh, emotionally uh, invested. Make an effort to recall names and acquaint yourselves with your patients. As I said before, it has, it, it's almost magic when, when you are called by your name uh, by the pharmacist it's as if you've built a, um, a friendship or something that's a lifelong loyalty that is a very valuable asset in your um, services. So I am coming towards the end of my talk. I would like to comment on one slide David showed us where there was a survey where 31% of pharmacists, of, of people, uh, who never would have thought to go to pharmacy would now go to the pharmacy or to the pharmacist after the pandemic, and 69% would seek self-care. Take that opportunity. Let's run with this opportunity. Build trust. Build trust in our profession. And thank you for your attention. Next slide is thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your very interesting and nice presentation, Betty. Now there is time for panel discussion. We have some questions and some time for the discussion. <clears throat> so I have one question I would like you all to answer. And the question is, how would you develop self-care even further in pharmacies worldwide? And the first one to answer is Alistair. Thank you. Um, it's a tough question because each country is so unique in their approach for, you know, enabling pharmacists and patients to have access to self-care. I think, you know, from my experience in Canada, I think a lot of the restrictions around pharmacists being able to provide therapy, whether it's you know um, not having prescriptive authority or medicines not being uh, you know down scheduled quick enough, I think that's probably the biggest one would be for pharmacists to have that prescriptive authority um, to be able to intervene and in, with patients or if patients come seeking help for self-diagnosed or self-identified conditions that we you know that we have much more leeway there. I think that's worked well, for example, with common ailments in Canada. And I think, uh, you know, it's a great start for patients to really help uh, get access to the care they need. Thank you. What about David? What, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I think? One of the first steps, and Alistair is absolutely correct, that every country is at different levels of development in not just self-care, but in all healthcare practice. And so 
Um, the first step on a journey uh, always starts with a bit of an inventory of where you're at, um, understanding what opportunities are already in existence, how to leverage those, and then also look at uh, some of the things that have been described today as future opportunities. And then really, uh, it is a matter of, of trying to connect the dots. Um, how do we get from our current state to our future state? Uh, and I'm going to say that it's by small steps. Um, and, it, and, and really, the good thing about self-care is that it's quite understandable by everybody. Um, if you take a look at the seven pillars that I was showing, I mean, just simple little things about risk avoidance, people can understand that. Now, not everybody is in a perfect position at the perfect time to say, well, I'm going to quit smoking. Um, but almost everybody understands that it's probably the right thing to do. And then having that iterative support, Betty was talking about, how do you support that intention? You can do it in simple steps. And uh, again, I, I just say that the, start with what you have, envision your future, develop the stepwise approach and try not to eat the elephant all in one bite. Yes, thank you. What about Parisa? What do you think? <laughs> I don't think I've got any more to add than what Alistair and David um, stated. I like that idea of just take note of where you're at uh, and I guess plan for that future, bearing in mind the context of where you are um, and also learning from other um, areas and, and other countries um, and really effectively plan for where, how you want to get to where you want to get. But I think uh, the essential ingredient um, and knowing the talk that I gave is the person, is the patient. Um, and I think as pharmacists, they are not only our bread and butter, but they're also the people that will advocate on our behalf. If we make a good impact um, health-wise satisfaction, just general health and well-being on a patient and a, and a person who visits the pharmacy, I think that goes a long way in terms of the impact um, on policy and practice as well, where if we're collecting the evidence, then we can show the impact for what we're doing. Thanks. Thank you for, for the nice answer. And then Betty, what do you think? Oh, thank you. Um, I don't think I can add much to that other than um, we are on the cusp of uh, change in our profession and with awareness about uh, patient-centred care, building trust and the experiences that we are uh, witnessing in Canada, USA, UK, Australia, some countries that have articulated um, how to go forward, the future is looking good. So hopefully all is well. Yes, thank you. I, will, I would like to ask, uh, ask still one question from David. We have time for just one, for one answer. Uh, what are the strongest limitations for not taking stronger role in self-care in pharmacies worldwide? So the limitations um, are both self-imposed and then authoritarian opposed, uh, imposed. Um, if people are, um, if pharmacy is not willing to engage, that's one thing. But if they're not allowed to engage, that's a whole other thing. And that's where I was talking about the, the need for a specific recommendations for uh, self-care integration into healthcare policies. And that's really where the governing bodies need to work together. I, I think there was a question in the chat there earlier about, um, and this is where I was talking about silos. Early in the days of pharmacists prescribing, doctors were so very much against it. Their mantra was a prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. And we all recognize that there are different levels of diagnosis. And I don't really particularly like the word. I do like the word of recognizing symptoms, recognizing conditions, 
and, and having a plethora of tools to apply to those conditions. Um, but really the, the biggest thing that stands in the way of progress is the silos and the institutionalization of lack of progress. It, it, in any organization, whether it is um, a, a company or a government or a movement, um, it, it tends to move at a pedantic pace. Things that actually cause change are disruptors. And I think COVID was one of those. And thank you, David, for, for the great answer. So now it's time for the final words. I want to once, once again thank our very great panelists today for very interesting and informative presentations. Thank you so much, Alistair, David, Parvisa, and Betty. It was very nice also to discuss with you. Uh, uh, there were a lot of things we discussed. Uh, some, some wrap up. Pharmacists and health officials can expedite access to treatments by eliminating barriers to care. Scope of practice and self-care can be expanded by vaccinations and coaching. In person-centered care, the patient is always in focus. And trust between pharmacists and their patients plays a key factor in the pharmacy and state. Next slide, please. Uh, next webinars will be supporting self-care musculoskeletal pain and chronicity, still in June, follow up and, and, and join. And check all future FIB digital events in events.fib.org. And remember the World Pharmacist Day that will be on 25th of September. It takes just a few simple steps to create your graphic and add your voice. The first of which is in, in the link you can see. Our hope is that colleagues in all countries, states in the world take part in advocating our great profession this year. World Pharmacist Day is now, it is the 11th year. And I want to warmly thank you all for your very nice and very warm participation. Thank you. Thank you all and bye.